Good afternoon, everyone. And I appreciate that so many of you were able to share where you were from in our welcome chat in the lobby. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. It is the top of the hour. So we want to be um, on time and timely, and we value your time. So I'm going to get us started this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're from. On behalf of the Office of Child Care, the State Capacity Building Center, Infant Toddler Specialist Network, and the National After School and Summer Enrichment Center, I welcome you to the call today. We are interested in knowing who is on the call today. So we are going to ask you to please fill in this poll. What is your role? And if your role is not represented in those top ones, please feel free to type it in the chat below. Looks like we have a lot of resource and referral staff. That's wonderful. And a lot of state agency staff. Great. A lot of training and technical assistance specialists. Wonderful. I think you'll find that this, this presentation will be really helpful in the work that you do. We've got a, someone from 21st Century Community Learning Center Leadership. That's awesome. And Infant Toddler Specialist Network Leadership. Great. Wonderful. And thank you for those of you that are adding your roles in the chat box below. That's really helpful for us as well. We're going to give you just another minute to finish that up, and then we're going to move into the presentation. We really appreciate knowing who's here today. We've got family life educators. Oh, awesome. Early childhood mental health, wonderful. And a director of tribal relations, wonderful. That's fantastic. And I am going to switch back. And if you didn't get a chance, you can always add it to the chat box and make sure that we get to hear from you as well. So now we'll take a moment to introduce ourselves. And for this call today, Katari and I will be facilitating the call. And so Katari, will you introduce yourself, please? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Katari Coleman. Um, I am the project director for the National Center on After School and Summer Enrichment. And I am excited about our webinar today. And I hope that you, we provide you with information that is useful. Jean? Wonderful. Thank you, Katari. My name is Jean Van Orsdell, and I am a infant toddler specialist, one of the infant toddler specialists in the network of, at the Child Care State Capacity Building Center. And I work with Region 5 and help out in Region 6. So those are the two regions I work with. And I do work with several states, a total of 11 of them. And while I won't be able to join you for the follow-up call that we'll have one week from, it, from today, Katari and Rana Schaefer, on behalf of the ITSN, will be on that call and we'll share details about that at the end of today's session. So I'd like to start out just sharing with you our objectives for today. We really want to give you the opportunity to hear about and hear what the definitions of trauma, toxic stress, and adverse childhood experiences are. We're going to describe the impact of trauma on children, and their caregivers, and identify strategies to support building resilience in children and their caregivers, as well as provide strategies that two of our states and one of our tribal nations are using to address adverse childhood experiences. So we're wondering if you would add to the chat box, what are you hoping to learn from today's webinar? 
everyone comes with their own lens and their own experiences to a situation and a, a webinar and professional development opportunity such as this. And we're just wondering what you're hoping to learn. So if you could add that to the chat box, we would love to hear from you. We'll take just a minute to let folks get that in there. New strategies. Uh, Michaela, I'm always looking for new strategies, and I'm always on the search for what I can find to help families impacted by trauma. So I can appreciate that. Again, Patricia said the same thing, and Cassie, additional tools for working with providers and families. Absolutely. Truly hoping to learn some new strategies and wanting, uh, yeah, so a lot of times we know that children who demonstrate or have been impacted by trauma can demonstrate some challenging behaviors, and sometimes programs will have a really hard time working with those folks and those children. And so really hoping that we can um, share and support you in thinking through some of those strategies that will support those children. And I see Jenny and Elizabeth and Sheila all from um, Michigan are talking about how to support providers. And we see Lynn talking about helping providers to see the connections. Absolutely. So important successful strategy. So we've got a common theme of thinking about those strategies and really thinking about how to support children and their families. And I think that's really important to remember that our children don't exist, um, out, they exist within the context, excuse me, of their families and their caregivers. And so of course we have to think about it in that context. So I really appreciate you adding so much to the chat box, and we're going to move over to another layout, but you're still going to have access to that chat box so that we can continue to hear from you. So thinking about trauma, what is trauma? In order to set the stage for our conversation today, we want to take a moment to think with you about what trauma and adverse childhood experiences are and the impact of stress on our lives and the lives of the children and families we serve. As we think about trauma, what are some of the words that you can think of that you use to describe trauma? What are some words that come to mind? And there is a chat box that's at the top right that you can start filling in some of those words that are connected to trauma. Things that, yeah, life-changing. It absolutely can be life-changing, Claudette, especially depending on when that, that trauma should happen. If it happens early enough in life, it can actually change the structure of a child's brain. And so we have to think about, wow, you know, that's life, lifelong impact and, ha and can impact that child's health specifically for their lifetime. Stressors, fears, vicarious. Absolutely. What happens when we're exposed to stress over a long period of time where a child is exposed to stress, not necessarily the recipient, but vicariously they are impacted? Absolutely. Toxic stress, negative experiences, all of these words are so important as we think about what trauma is and what that means. So as it is described by the Substance Abuse for Ment and Mental Health Services Administration, they describe trauma as resulting from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, and emotional or spiritual well-being. It is important to keep in mind that what is traumatic to one person may not be traumatic to someone else. How a person perceives an experience influences the effect it has on that individual. 
it also matters how many experiences, traumatic experiences, a person has had. Because as they add up, they also respond differently to trauma. Traumatic events can lead to child traumatic stress. Children who have witnessed traumatic events, such as domestic violence, shootings, or even fighting, can develop traumatic stress that in time can impact their physical and emotional health. Child traumatic stress is defined by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network as stress that occurs when a child experiences an intense event that threatens or causes harm to his or her emotional and physical well-being. Children who suffer from traumatic stress from exposure to one or more traumas in their lives may develop reactions that continue to affect their daily lives long after the traumatic events have ended. Traumatic events or experiences, oftentimes termed as adverse childhood experiences, may be direct, where a child is the victim, or indirect, where a child is a witness. Katari, will you please tell us more about adverse childhood experiences? Yes. As we discuss trauma, we also need to discuss underlying factors that our families, the workforce, and children face. Many of you are familiar with the concept or have already probably received training on adverse childhood experiences. We know that adverse childhood experiences influence how a person or child reacts to an additional trauma or adverse experience. So ACEs, as we call it, are potentially traumatic events that occur in, ch in childhood from birth to 17 years old as we see here, such as experiencing violence, abuse, or neglect, witnessing violence in the home, or having a family member attempt or die by suicide. It also, inclu also included are aspects of the child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding, such as growing up in a household with substance misuse, mental health problems, or instability due to parental separation or incarceration of a parent, sibling, or other member of the household. The adverse experiences that were included in the original study in are abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, household challenges, a mother or child seeing their mother treated violently, substance misuse in a household, mental illness in the household, parental separation or divorce, and incarceration of a household member, as well as neglect, emotional or physical neglect. As far as the prevalence of ACEs in the United States, updated studies have included additional information. So in the 2014 Child Trends Report, we now know that economic hardship is the most common adverse childhood experience reported nationally and in almost all states followed by divorce or separation of a parent or guardian. Nearly half, 45% of children in the United States have experienced at least one ACE. Across the nation, one in 10 children have experienced three or more ACEs. And we know that children of different races and ethnicities do not experience ACEs equally. We want to go on to look at the impact of this stress. It can be categorized by the response. Positive stress response, which here you see is brief, increases in heart rate, mild elevation in stress hormone levels. This type of stress is a normal and essential part of brain development. So, for example, the first day at school with a new caregiver or going to the doctor's office receiving an immunization shot. Tolerable stress 
response to serious temporary stress responses suffered by supportive relationships. Examples of that is loss of a loved one, a natural disaster, or frightening injury in which they have supportive relationships to allow them to get through that stressful time. The last one here, and where we focus, is toxic stress response. Experiencing strong, frequent, and or prolonged adversity without adequate adult support. This can disrupt the development of brain, the brain architecture, and other organ systems and increases the risk for stress-related disease and cognitive impairment into the adult years. So examples of this are physical or emotional abuse, chronic neglect, caregiver substance abuse or mental health, exposure to violence, and or accumulated burdens of family and economic hardship. According to the Center for Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation from Georgetown University, Center for Child and Human Development, and, and grows lessons from the Child Witness to Violence Project, we see here that childhood trauma can occur when a frightening event overwhelms a child's ability to cope or threatens the safety of the child's caregiver. And they are experiences of trauma do not necessarily become a diagnosis or disorder. So we know that it is important for us to understand trauma and help children so it does not turn out to be a lifelong situation. So Jean, how does Thanks. trauma impact caregivers? Thank you, Katari. In order to understand how to support children experiencing trauma, we must also consider how trauma impacts their caregivers. Adults who have experienced ACEs in their own early years can exhibit reduced parenting capacity or have difficulty in responding to children in appropriate ways. The changes have occurred to the adult's stress response system and as a result of earlier trauma, they can result in a decreased, it can result in a decreased capacity to respond to additional stressors excuse me, in a healthy way. Adverse childhood experiences increase the chance of social risk factors, mental health issues, substance abuse, intimate partner violence, and adoption of risky adult behaviors. All of these things can impact parenting in a negative way. But what about the educators? Any educators who work directly with traumatized children and adolescents is vulnerable to the effects of trauma, referred to as compassion fatigue or secondary traumatic stress, being physically, mentally, or emotionally worn out or feeling overwhelmed by children or students' trauma. Secondary traumatic stress is the emotional duress that results when an individual hears about the firsthand trauma experiences of another. Its symptoms mimic those of post-traumatic stress disorder. All professionals working with traumatized children can learn approaches and strategies to protect themselves from being emotionally overwhelmed by this work. The ability to help traumatized children depends on our ability to stay emotionally healthy and motivated in difficult and often very frustrating situations. It is also important to recognize that your own trauma experienced in your childhood or trauma memory can prevent you from being warm and responsive to a child. The resource at the bottom of the slide, the Child Trauma Toolkit for Educators, is available from SAMHSA and might be of assistance to you. It is a comprehensive resource for educators, including those of preschool children. So now let's turn 
to the impact on children. Infants and toddlers. This quote by Dr. Sorrell says, it was once believed that traumatic memories in the early days of life had no impact on the life of an individual. We now know that is not true. In her book, Reaching and Teaching Children Exposed to Trauma, Dr. Sorrells talks about how the development of a baby's brain can be impacted even prior to birth. A baby's brain is most vulnerable to the adverse effects of increased stress hormones created by mothers who are experiencing extreme adversity, such as poor nutrition, worry over financial concerns, domestic violence, and or substance misuse. Now that we know that trauma impacts infants in utero and beyond, we need to also understand that these children may not only have a brain that is wired differently, but also is disorganized, which may result in disorganized behavior. As I share these signs and symptoms of trauma in infants, we can think about them in three different buckets, physical dysregulation, relational dysregulation, and behavioral dysregulation. Signs and symptoms that infants may show for physical dysregulation include eating and sleeping issues, easily startled or failure to thrive. As far as relational dysregulation, infants may arch their back when held, look away or push away their caregiver's face, or doesn't cry when they are in need. Behavioral dysregulation symptoms include intense, prolonged crying, an inability to be soothed, or very passive. The signs and symptoms of trauma in toddlers include physical signs or symptoms that a toddler might have related, maybe toilet delay, toilet training delay, delay in walking, rigid muscles, lack of appetite or overeating. Relational signs may include that the child runs away or becomes defiant towards caregivers, clingy, does not seek being close to caregivers when in distress, or pushing the child's caregiver away when face-to-face. -face. Behavioral signs may include tantrums, reckless, accident prone, aggressive behavior, sadness, or language delay. But keep in mind that some of these behaviors are developmentally appropriate for toddlers. So many toddlers are just learning their boundaries and they run away or become defiant towards their caregivers. It is when these behaviors are extreme that we should be wondering what might be the cause. So now let's turn it over to Katari to tell us about the impact of trauma on school-age children. Yes, let's look at school-age children. Let's consider the school-ager's brain first. At this time, development is extremely robust. With neural connections still undergoing pruning, Wiring still in progress. Fatty tissues surrounding the neurons are increasing and assisting with fine tuning of electrical impulses, and the connections are becoming more stable. The prefrontal cortex is just entering its maturation phase, which involves the control of impulses and decision making. As you can see here, a lot is going on in the brain of the school ager a lot to consider when it comes to the experiencing trauma. Earlier, we discussed toxic stress in all humans, but specifically the school-age child. Toxic stress from trauma can result in the admission of flight, fight, or freeze, or better known as the F3 syndrome. As you see here, from the image. Fight is a physical reaction, so it's showing of resistance. Flight is the act of escaping or running from the trauma, and freeze is a non-reactive response, 
literally standing still or not moving. F3 is the body's automatic built-in system designed to protect us from threat or danger. But this prolonged or continuous involvement in this process can lead to changes in neurodevelopment, the production of symptoms of dysregulation, hyperarousal, sensory sensitivity, avoidance and dissociation. It can impact cognition, memory, and visual processing and lead to inattention, aggressiveness with other children, academic and social challenges at school as well. Trauma-impacted youth may experience a litany of symptoms or show indicators like difficulty paying attention in school or in multiple environments, be quiet or withdrawn, have frequent tears or bouts of sadness, talk often about scary feelings and ideas, difficulty, they can have difficulty in transitioning from one activity to the next, they might fight with peers or adults, and have changes in school performance, usually seen as a drop in grades. They want to be left alone. They eat much more or less than their peers. They get in trouble at home and or school. They may have frequent headaches or stomach aches with no apparent cause. And they often exhibit behaviors common to younger children. So bum sucking, bed wetting, fear of the dark, things like that. From here, we want to now talk about and look at strategies to build resist, resilience, sorry, resilience. We will first would like to know what words you feel describe resilience. At this time, please enter those words into the chat pod to share with us and the other participants. Looks like a lot of people are getting started. Bounce back. Oh, a survivor. Jody says social support. Coping skills. Emotional support. Strength. All of these are awesome and they do, are part of what is part of resilience to move on, building relationships. Oh, Michelle says toughness, I like that. Connections, I see a theme of trying to try again. Also bounce back, it says several times. Being supported. I'll give you a few more minutes for those of you that are, a few more moments for those of you that are typing. Oh, I like feisty, dynamic, self-aware, self-esteem, having tenacity. Yes. Okay, so we're going to go into, continue on on the presentation. These are some wonderful examples or words that describe resilience. Um, and yes, resilience embodies all of that. So, we want to start out by defining resilience. According to the Center on the Developing Child, resilience is defined as the ability to overcome serious hardship. 
Reducing the efforts of significant adversity on children's healthy development is essential to the progress and prosperity of any society. It is crucial for us to understand why some children do well despite adverse experiences, because it can inform more effective policies and programs that help more children reach their full potential. And so we see here this definition really embodies all the words and descriptions that you get, you guys. Yay. It is important for us to really look at what are the factors when children do seem to overcome those exact adverse experiences. And then what are the factors when other children may have challenges in overcoming those um, adverse experiences and then putting in those supports. So we're going to move along and Dean is going to share with you um, further information to support resilience. Thank you, Katari. So as we think about care that is trauma-informed and re trauma-responsive to the needs of the children and family, caregivers, and teachers, we must also understand how trauma changes the brain, impacts behavior, and affects relationships. So as Dr. Sorrells reminds us, it is the one, it's ongoing daily interactions with loving, emotionally responsive, and caring adults, be they a teacher, a caregiver, an aunt, or a grandfather that bring about healing. As long as we are keeping all of these things in mind as we move forward, this will allow states, programs, and caregivers to create environments and family support that are responsive to children and provide a sense of emotional safety and healing. So one of the things that one way in which we can build relationships with all children and that these relationships are formed that are responsive to trauma is to create for them a sense of belonging. So think about an infant toddler room, a family child care home, or an outer school, school environment that you have been in. How did the children know that they belonged there? How did they feel included in that room? And I'll give you a few seconds and a few minutes maybe to type that into either one of the chat pods. I'd love to see what your answers are. Do they feel welcomed when they arrived? Oh, yes. Are there caregivers greeting them when they arrive? Do they feel comfortable with the adults and other children? Is there a synergy? Is there a feeling of, of being part of the group? The children walk in comfortably on their own to their environment. Yes, yes. Are they greeted warmly? I think that is one of the first things that we think of when we think about a sense of belonging, right? Is that as a child enters their environment in which they're going to have care provided for them, are they greeted warmly? Are there photos of their family and respect for their own culture and, and their own artifacts from their home or their ethnicity? talking to them about things that matter to them, about mom, dad, pet. Yes, all of these are so great. I love these. Comfort items are available to them. Is it a child-friendly environment with developmentally appropriate materials? And also developmentally appropriate expectations, right, Maria? Because we want to make sure that we're thinking about the children and where they're at individually. Do they feel safe? Do they feel loved? Is there artwork or projects on display? Do they have a place for their things to belong? Do staff address them by name? Oh, I love that. 
I, it just, this all brings me back to when I was providing care and greeting families when they would come in in the morning or setting up my environment. And I love all of these suggestions because these are all the ways in which the child and the family feel like they are a part of the program and part of that room that they are going to be entering into. Does the home play area reflect all of their family systems? Nice, Denny. That's a great one. Positive interactions at their level, Liz. I love that. You know, our our caregivers getting down to their level so that they feel listened to. Do they feel respected? So for infants and toddlers, that engagement with caregivers is so important. And seeing the children's work on the walls and the photo family, photos of family members, are there daily notes or picture portfolios so that a family can come in and see what their child's done and feel like they're engaged in that? Yes, Maria, environment allows for positive individual and group experiences. Yes. Ma'am, I love it. For school-age children, is there engagement from the out-of-school time providers? Is there artwork from the youth on the walls? And I know I, having run a school-age program, that can be kind of challenging some days because you might be in a gym and that might be where your um, program meets and it may not feel like that is an environment in which you can put up things. And so how do you creatively make sure that they feel included in those environments? Are there photos of the experiences that they've had within the, the group itself or within the program? Are there daily notes of encouragement or picture portfolios? But these are just some of the ways in which we build a sense of belonging. But that sense of belonging is so important to a child who has experienced trauma. They often don't feel included. They often feel like they are an outsider or they feel like they are different. So all of those ways in which we create a sense of belonging helps them to feel like they have support. And that is going to help build their resilience. So let's think about another area, and that is individualized care. Building relationships. So it is another way in which we, re we support care that is responsive to children who have experienced trauma. And we help them build resilience. And that is pro provided through that individualized care. And that is by learning each child's individual needs. And I think that's um, one of the things that I found when I did care myself. I found probably one of my favorite things was knowing special things about each child and where they were at and what they liked and what their individual needs were. And then learning about all children within the context of their family. So think about for a minute what it was like to be in a new relationship. Did you think about that person all the time? Did you learn their likes and their dislikes? And you wanted good things for them? So those are all those things that happen when you're in a relationship with a child or a family where you can start building all of those opportunities. Remembering that development happens in a natural progression, you'll remember that maybe that child isn't as far along as some of the other children in the group, but you recognize for that child, that's exactly where they should be. Be mindful and present in the moment. And that is one that I know some programs that I have talked to over the years have struggled with now with the introduction of screens because everyone feels they need to be engaged with screens. And so, you know, you may have to remind providers or practitioners that putting down the screens for the time that they are with the children is extremely important in building relationships. 
And that building relationships is part of what builds resilience in those children. In fact, relationships are the thing that builds resilience in children. So staying engaged, being trustworthy, being consistent. So your goal is to build a relationship with each child, and we know that all of those things are important. And having a strength-based attitude, I love that. I love that. I know that there are states out there that focus on that specifically with their work that they're doing with some of their caregivers in their consulting programs, that it's all built around strength-based models. And that's what we should be looking for, is that strength-based model of relationships, because that is what is going to make a difference for children. And so as we think about continuity of care, part of relationship-based care is continuity of care. And this includes having consistent caregivers for children, the person that they look for each night after school or each morning when they get dropped off for care. Routines provide predictability and consistency. In her work, Dr. Sorrells talks about how environments that lack structure and routine are stressful for all children, but even more so for those with a history of maltreatment. Stable and predictable routines allow children to relax and feel safe. Keeping children together in a cohort model when moving them from one room to the next, preferably with their primary caregiver, is another way in which programs can support relationship-based care. And in some of our states, they have chosen to adopt the Program for Infant Toddler Care Six Essential Program Practices as a relationship-based care model. And they utilize our network. In fact, I work with states in both my regions on the implementation of the Six Essential Practices to support caregivers adopting this framework of care, which supports relationship-based care and responsive caregiving for infants and toddlers. And that is another way in which we can support children who are impacted by trauma. So Katari, will you please share with us some of the ways in which we can support school-age children? Yes. When it comes to school-age children, programs and providers can build resilience in school-agers by subscribing to positive youth development principles, which are, number one, focus on strengths and positive outcomes. Connecting back to what Jean stated about the strength-based model, she mentioned, when she mentioned when she was talking about individualized care, this is, is a connection right here. So rather than taking a deficit-based approach, communities and programs can intentionally help young people build on their strengths and develop the competencies, values, and connections they need for life and work to become a productive citizen. The second is youth voice and engagement Youth must be valued partners who have meaningful decision-making roles in programs and communities. Third, strategies that involve all youth. So communities um, can support and engage all youth rather than focusing solely on high-risk or gifted youth. Communities do, however, recognize the need to identify and respond to specific problems faced by some youth, such as violence or premature parenthood. So this, the strategies that involve all youth are really there so no child falls through the cracks. Four, community involvement and collaboration. Positive youth development includes but reaches beyond programs. It promotes organizational change and collaboration for community change. All sectors have a role to play in making the community a great place to grow up in. 
And then lastly there, we see long-term commitment. Communities provide the ongoing, developmentally appropriate support young people need over the first 20 years of their life. Very important. So right here, we have another poll. At this time, we ask that you complete a poll. Please share if your state has a program or initiative or activity that they are aware of to support children, families, and caregivers impacted by trauma. Um, there's two parts. If yes, please share the name of the program in the second part of the poll. In the first part of the poll, please just let us know yes, no, yes or no. And it looks like there's a great deal of states, territories, or tribes that are currently implementing programs or initiatives or some sort of activity to support children, families, and their caregivers impacted by trauma. Some great stuff coming up here. Oh, Lorena mentions a program called Inclusive Partners. And Andrea talks about family engagement. Um, Eva, they're expanding quality and infant toddler care in Colorado. Um, Lisa, there is, where you are, there's a program called ROOTS, R-O-O-T-S. Um, Sarah says trauma-informed care credential for child care directors. That is awesome. Um, ACES training. Julie shared with us the ACES training that they're doing. Um, Rochelle talked about the foster care bridge and um, internal TIC and social emotional learning training, so that's trauma informed care and social emotional learning training focused on trauma. Um, wow, so much here. Project Forecast from Telena. Kelly, they said her state is implementing ACEs, so I'm sure that there's a, a litany of activities that are being implemented. Trauma informed community training ongoing ACEs training, strength-based communication and relationship-based approaches with child care providers and families. I love that. Very important. Susan talks about strength-based family worker training. Wonderful. Oh my goodness, there's so much here. Um, infant mental health endorsement for child care providers in New Jersey. All right. And I see a theme of ACEs training across the state, territory, and tribe. Yes, okay. Resilient and trauma-informed community task force. Wow, Susan, that's awesome. So I'll give you a few moments for some of you that are still typing in some information. But we want to go and start talking about um, trauma-informed care or responsive. We want to throw in the word of responsive. So Previously, the go-to term was trauma-informed, but it is important that providers, programs, and systems are trauma-responsive. Now, let's dive into some strategies for being trauma-responsive. Recent literature highlights that at the heart of trauma-informed care is sensitivity to the student or child. So, past and current at 
adverse experiences um, and a deeper understanding of why they may be acting out or why they may be acting a certain way. The term trauma-informed care somewhat has limitations. Trauma-responsive care encourages support and treatment of the whole person rather than focus on only learning about trauma. So how does trauma responsive practice look in a program or organization? It realizes the impact of trauma and potential paths for recovery. So it also recognizes signs and symptoms of trauma in families and stress. Integrates knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices and seeks to actively to re, seeks actively to resist re-traumatization. That number four is very important because in our practices, sometimes we don't realize our policies and practices may lead to re-traumatization. So how do we build resilience in families? What can states do to help build resilience in families? They can provide consumer education. So this is providing information to parents and other family members around the health and developmental needs of children. They can provide comprehensive services, which is a team approach to serving families. It includes connecting families to services such as health, nutrition, mental health, social services, disabilities, their needs on disabilities, and early childhood education services. Employ and also, we can employ, states can employ the tenets of strengthening families, which is based on engaging families, programs, and communities in building five key protective factors, excuse me. Parental resilience, social connections, knowledge of parenting and child development, concrete support in times of need, and social and emotional competence of children. One state can, states can also use trauma-responsive caseworkers, making sure that they are, they have or are infused with understanding relationship-based competencies for their child care caseworkers that are in trauma-informed and that are trauma-informed and responsive and thus more sensitive to the needs of families when experiencing trauma and to help them connect to the services that they need. Another state is in the process of adopting trauma responsive care model creating trainers and coaches to train others and assist with implementation of trauma-responsive care. So having that model of trainers and coaches and individuals who can be the subject matter experts around presenting information throughout your state, territory, or tribal nation. So also, as we look at some ways in which states can support the resilience of caregivers, we see that one, they should encourage the development of child care associations for their caregivers so they can have the opportunity to meet and learn from their peers, very important. Two, so this is both family child care, for example, family child care associations and administrator associations. But number two is shared services. To support a strategy for maximizing the impact of resources invested in early childhood and school-aged children, primarily for those providing direct services to children and their families through shared services. Three, support for professional development. So the support for development and delivery of professional development of caregivers 
is important in that we need to understand and we, they need to understand and respond to trauma, to provide responsive caregiving, to engage family and programs, and to take care of them, their selves. So staff wellness, as it says there. Also, additional supports can include specialists, infant toddler specialists, school age specialists, social emotional learning specialists, um, infant mental health specialists. As well as being a pyramid model state um, to, that supports positive social and emotional strategies for programs. So as we see, there are strategies that states can implement to support resilience of families and caregivers, which will in turn support the building of resilience in children. So at this time, we are going to move into a wonderful part of our presentation today, which we will have three presenters, two state presenters, and a tribal nation presenter. Each will share information on how their state and tribe is addressing trauma and building resilience today. If you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat pod. Once the presenters are done addressing their specific questions, we hope to have time for them to answer some of your questions. So now I get the distinct pleasure of introducing Jude White, who serves as the Assistant Commissioner for Child Care and Social Services with the Tennessee Department of Human Services. I am proud to say that my past work with Tennessee crossed with Assistant, Assistant Commissioner White, specifically with the Early Childhood Advisory Council there in Tennessee. I want to welcome Jude as she um, answers some questions for, for us. Thanks, Katari. Good to be here. Great to have you here, Jude. We have three questions for you. So, uh, Assistant Commissioner White, please respond after I read each question. What was the motivation for Tennessee to address trauma and resilience in children? Sure. So, as a lot of people know, the foundational ACES study by, done by doctors and Ancelotti goes back to the mid-90s. Um, in Tennessee, our Department of Health was doing uh, population surveys related to behavioral risk factors. And in 2012, our State Department of Health included an ACEs module in that behavioral risk factor survey. So that gave them a lot of helpful information about the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences in our state. And in 2015, they released a report called Adverse Childhood Experiences, Adverse childhood experiences in Tennessee, Fact, Not Fate. So it was an opportunity really to introduce the concept of adverse childhood experiences to a larger audience. And through that report, um, the issue of adverse childhood experiences came to the attention of our highest level of our governor's administration. Uh, the, the Department of Health Commissioner at the time was very focused on prevention. So he would regularly talk about how do we move upstream? How do we move upstream? How do we prevent some of these chronic health conditions. So he was a real champion for understanding adverse childhood experiences and the impact on our, our long-term health outcomes. So it really did get the attention of the highest levels of our administration. And at the time, we had what was called the Three Branches Institute. And it was a gathering of representatives from the executive branch, the judicial branch, and, and the legislative branch. And they would meet to talk about issues that really crossed those sectors in our state government. And so information about ACEs was brought to the Three Branches Institute and they adopted it as a priority across all three branches. And that led to a, an initial summit 
uh, focused on adverse childhood experiences. And our governor, first lady, um, one of our Supreme Court justices, and various legislators all participated in that kickoff summit. So it really generated a lot of momentum for a better understanding of ACEs in Tennessee. Wonderful, thank you. So what efforts have been made to address trauma and build resilience across the state? Yes, so after that uh, kickoff summit in 2015, what's called our Building Strong Brains initiative really got off the ground, and that's what we call our cross-sector work on ACEs. And so the Building Strong Brains initiative was launched in order to bring about culture change in Tennessee and to allow us all to focus on the overarching philosophy, policies, programs, and practices so that they would reflect the latest brain science to prevent and mitigate the impact of ACEs. And the goal of this culture change was to shift the conversation from what is wrong with this child to what has happened to this child to help all, all sectors interact uh, with children from that more informed place. So as part of the Building Strong Brains initiative, there were multiple uh, symposia that were held with speakers from across the country. We had multiple frame labs, which focused on how we communicate information about adverse childhood experiences and resilience. Uh, it really has been a multi-sector approach. We have both a public steering committee, which has representatives from a lot of departments in state government. And then we also have a private sector steering committee that includes private foundations and nonprofit agencies and advocacy groups uh, that are interested in the issues. Through this, this education and advocacy, uh, we've been able to secure uh, money in the state budget on a recurring basis, um, not quite two and a half million that is used to support community level innovations focused on ACEs. Uh, we have had all uh, judges and staff of the juvenile courts statewide have been trained in adverse childhood experiences and there was even a session um, called ACEs for legislators that was provided to some of the legislative staff. Awesome. So our third question is, what efforts and outcomes related to educating caregivers on trauma and resilience and equipping them with applicable resources is Tennessee most proud of accomplishing? So in several, like I said, it's really been a multi-sector approach. So you could talk to folks in the health arena, the child welfare arena, any number of different areas about what they've done in their space um, to be more informed about ACEs. And so specifically in the child care and educator space, uh, we now have in our child care licensing regulations that every um, early childhood educator is required to have ACEs training at least once every five years. Uh, we have a, a, a relatively new contract with a group called AIM High Tennessee, which stands for the Association of Infant Mental Health in Tennessee. They do some of those um, infant mental health endorsements that some of the other states were talking about. But we have a contract with them to provide some training to our CCRNR infant toddler coaches to help them support our providers. Um, through our Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth, generally they have done train the trainer sessions about ACEs, so they have presented that information to about 1,000 trainers who have now reached more than 40,000 individuals across the state. And then specifically, we have had over 5,000 um, public school teachers and administrators have been trained in strategies uh, for teachers. And at least 72 of our schools have become trauma-informed schools. So even within that early childhood and and educator space, um, different sectors are getting involved um, to strengthen the way we serve these families. Wow, thank you for this enlightening information. 
the Building Strong Brains uh, Tenancy ACES initiative seems to have a very firm multi-cross-sector infrastructure with legislative supports, which allows for, from what I'm hearing, um, cross uh, continued growth and more families and children to address past trauma and build resilience. So that is really awesome. Thank you, Thank you. Jude, yeah. and yeah. we are going. We're going to go on to our next presenter, but we may have questions for you coming up. Sounds good. Yes, thank you so much, Jude. I really appreciate that perspective from Tennessee. And so now we're going to move to Arkansas. And Audrey Freshwater, who is the Early Childhood Education Adverse Childhood Experiences Administrator, Behavior Health Help Administrator in the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education in Arkansas is going to share about her experiences as well. And I'm really excited about this piece because um, we always talk about in this work of technical assistance for the Office of Child Care how we all learn so much from other states. And Audrey's going to be able to share some of her experience and how what Tennessee was doing was brought into Arkansas. So, Audrey? Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for having me. We're so excited that you're here. So can you start addressing some of these questions? I know um, you may want to, to um, put more than one question into your response, but how, we'll start with how did Arkansas learn about Tennessee's work on adverse childhood experiences? Yeah, so I actually grew up in Arkansas, but I lived in Nashville, Tennessee for um, a little over 10 years. So Jude talked a lot about, um, you know, the timeline of the work uh, in Tennessee, uh, and I was really fortunate that I got to be part of that. Um, so I am, I'm a trainer, a trained trainer in building strong brains, um, but I was living in Nashville during the time um, that the work was going on. And so I got the opportunity to come back to Arkansas, um, and it really started with uh, I knew where, where my state was when, it, when you're thinking about the d national data um, for children who are experiencing um, adverse childhood experiences. And so, you know, I was really thinking I've spent, you know, over a decade of my career in Tennessee training individuals and advocating for children around this work. But I also know where my state is um, and the need there. And so I was actually speaking at a conference and happened to meet my now boss. Um, and so that's that's how I got um, back to Arkansas and have worked really closely with um, the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth um, and Jennifer Drakecroft, who's the Director of Child Wellbeing there, um, on adapting this um, for Arkansas, but also we've now sent people to Tennessee to be trained so that I have some assistance. Um, because I actually trained over 1,800 people in Building Strong Brains in 2019. Um, and so I was, I was very busy uh, training. And so now I've got some help, and we're looking to host more of those as well. But uh, that's how we kind of got started, um, is that you know I ended up here and knew of the work of Tennessee, and I'm still very connected to my former colleagues. Um, and so it's really been, honestly, a true partnership um, since I've been back in Arkansas. That's great. And you knew the need that Arkansas had and the, and mm -hmm. the high number of ACEs that were occurring in the population there. And mm -hmm. so that really started that motivation for addressing the trauma and resilience Tell us more about how you adopted the Tennessee model. What what happened? I know that you did a lot of training, but did you take it and um, address it in within the context of the professional development system? Tell me more about that. Um, so our we've done several. So we've done several things. So we uh, we worked with Tennessee. Um, to adapt it in a sense of uh, some of the data that is addressed in Building Strong Brains. Um, I use some of Tennessee's data 
however, there were da there was data that we had specifically to Arkansas. Um, and so we adapted just the presentation itself um, to include that and our, also our landscape um, and things that we already have going on. So in Arkansas, we have what's called the Behavior Help um, System, which I'm the administrator of. And Behavior Help is a, it's a group of individuals um, in the division and then also contract partners. And our early childhood educators are able to submit a referral online. And then we conduct an interview. And then we staff that with our um, providers, which are um, do classroom management, conscious discipline, technical assistance, and then also mental health consultation. And so we staff that. And when, then we assign it based on um, the needs of the child. And so that's how we do, we do a lot of suspension and expulsion work. Um, we don't allow the suspension and expulsion of children, and um, especially the, those children who are funded through um, state funding. Should a program suspend or expel a child, there are, there are consequences and a corrective action plan. So we take that very seriously. Uh, we also address it in our minimum licensing and our better beginnings, which is our quality rating and improvement scale. And so, we, and then we also address it on the professional development standpoint in that we inundate the field with social emotional learning. Um, we do a lot of coaching. We do. Um, you know, just a, a really a focus on social emotional um, and the importance and um, how we are laying that foundation. And so we continue to be in contact with Tennessee. They've actually come to Arkansas um, and they have spoken alongside of us, uh, which I think, you know, it, it helps because they, they are ahead of us in some things that have happened. Um, and then there's also things that we are doing, such as behavior help, um, that they don't have. And so it, we're able to, you know, help each other and kind of stand united in the work that we're doing um, and lessons learned and things like that. I think that's wonderful. I know that um, your behavior health help system is widely recognized mm -hmm. across the United States mm -hmm. as a um, a best practice, you know, something that people can strive for. And so that's really exciting that that's all part of this integration of this work. And if you had to choose just one of your successes, because I know you have many in Arkansas, <laughs> what would have been one of the greatest successes so far? Um, you know, I've, I've only been back in Arkansas a little over a year. And so while, while I think I brought the ability to bridge the gap between us and Tennessee because they are my former colleagues. A lot of work was already happening and, and the foundation had been laid. And so when I think back, what is our greatest success? Um, while well, you're right, we've got behavior help and we have a lot of other initiatives that, that are really exciting. I think our biggest success is our ability to all get in the same sandbox for the sake of the children. And so a lot of times what we run into is, um, you know, adults who feel the need to have ownership or that, um, you know, I don't know, maybe we're afraid of, of other, uh, cro it being like a cross-sector initiative. You know, I don't really, I don't know. Um, I think we have gotten really great at getting people from, you know, tons of different state agencies and even different states and getting everyone in the same room and really talking through how we're going to address this. Um, you know, I always, I always use the, the Bruce Perry quote. Um, when he talks about uh, the work that he did in Waco and that the biggest thing that they learned is that it, it's proximity, it's relationships um, with people and putting aside where they work um, for the best interest of children. And so that, that is our focus, our, our motto, so to speak, here. So that is probably um, 
the thing that I am, you know, proudest of, and um, I certainly cannot take credit for that. I think that that just speaks to the work of our division director, Tanya Williams, and um, and others. Um, Dr. Nikki Edge, who who's over behavior health for University of Arkansas Medical Sciences, uh, those people who've kind of been on the front lines for a long time and and laid that groundwork really. Absolutely, absolutely, and I love how it all comes back to relationships once again. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so much. And if you want to glance through the chat, I noticed there's some questions that have popped up that you might have a feeling that you mm -hmm. want to be a part of that discussion as well as we move on to our next speaker. And so now I get the privilege of introducing Meg. And Meg Fairchild, who is, from is a Michigan ACE certified master trainer, social services director. She is from the Nottawasepi Huron Band of the Potawatomi. And I'm so excited to have her on the call as well because I really think it's so um, exciting to have the perspective of the tribe and really think about um, how the ACEs peace and how trauma is impacting those folks as well and be able to hear from someone who knows firsthand. And so, Meg, I'm so excited to have you here. Um, want to ask you for your first question, what was the motivation for addressing the issue of trauma experienced by the children and families in your tribe? Thanks. And good afternoon, everybody. So I've been in the social work field for 30 years, and part of it is I was fortunate enough to grow up with uh, Dr. Anda and Dr. Filetti's um, ACES study and understand trauma, loss, and grief as part of my work with families and children in a variety of areas over those years. When I came to work for the tribe here, it became very apparent while trauma impacts everyone and it's a universal human experience, there's also additional layers of trauma that impact specific groups, especially tribal people with um, the experience of historical trauma that occurred through colonization and loss of language and lands and culture and the, the continued um, practices, policy practices of the boarding school era and the scoop era and adopting children into non-native homes. So all of that has continued to have an impact in successive generations because when people are traumatized and don't learn necessarily positive skills, then they continue to traumatize others. And the other thing I noticed when I was working here is that when people, our clients we were serving were having trauma responses, that traumatized staff, and so then it just continued that cycle of lateral violence and lashing out and re-traumatizing because, you know, as the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. So, you know, we just continue to, continue to per perpetuate that problem. Um, through that, I became more uh, trained, sought out trainings for myself, and there was a couple other staff members too at the time, looking for individualized trainings for um, from Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart and through the Native Wellness Institute, um, Eduardo Duran and um, Dr. Art Martinez, all um, gave us that different perspective on how how will the tribal historical trauma impacts or connects melds with the ACEs and general trauma experiences that people may may have. And so that's, looking at it from that perspective is what really got us exploring that more and what else could we do to help people become aware and understand that trauma history and how it continues to impact people today and in this generation and what we can do to prevent that from being passed on to future generations. Wow, and to think about all of the different sources in which you were able to pull together information and really think about this globally. What has your tribe done to address the trauma and build resilience? So as we've, you know, had some of these trainings as individuals and discussed that with others, with a new staff have come on board, we have explored that further and we were able to access and utilize resources from different um, cooperative agreements and grants. Um, one of them was through Project Launch with SAMHSA, and that we actually collaborated with two of our neighboring Potawatomi tribes here in Michigan, 
as a collaborative and use, utilize that funding and some of the grant objectives for uh, workforce development. So we were able to really provide all staff with training, all the current government staff at that time, with training on uh, historical trauma. So everybody had a better understanding of what that was and what that might look like in present day uh, mental health consultation. And then with that, we partnered with our uh, child care resource center and our local child care providers and preschool programs, as well as maternal child programs and the child care development fund. Um, so we were able to work specifically with those to offer them more services, more understanding, more awareness about what it means to be trauma-informed and trauma-responsive. And we were able to provide some ongoing reflective supervision for those who were directly providing services for families so they could process their their secondary trauma that they were experiencing or some of those emotions that were triggered for them either from their own ACEs or that secondary response. In addition, we another area of focus was family strengthening. So just providing opportunities for families to be together and build those relationships because we all know that those, the formulation of relationships like that is the biggest factor in building resilience. So we were able to offer uh, specific activities and opportunities for families to have the ability to learn a different way of doing that and to build positive relationships and interactions. Shortly after that, we were the grant ended and then we were able to keep on uh, a prevention specialist who continued some of that work in providing that reflective supervision and infant mental health and mental health consultation to our preschool providers and as well as continuing the uh, trauma awareness and education. And then with our health department also received an opportunity to be part of a learning collaborative through Johns Hopkins for the Pediatric Integrated Care Collaborative, which then connected us with the Menominee Tribe in Wisconsin, who's done a lot of work around um, integrating that throughout the tribe, integrating the understanding of trauma and tra being trauma-informed and collaborating with outside partners, not just keeping that internally to one agency or one program. So that gave us some other ideas and we're using some of their curriculum and educational opportunities to work with our teams. And so we can have these small group discussions. So there's, we've divided groups up and we meet like every four to six weeks to address a specific topic related to ACEs or trauma and are trying to move it beyond just being trauma informed to being that trauma responsiveness. We still have a long way to go and we're working on then translating that into policy, but that'll come with time. Um, another piece, we had a grant that allowed us to be trained with through Star Commonwealth in Courageous Connections. So we offer that quarterly to all new staff and our community partners, and we're looking at tweaking that to make it more specific to NHBP, so the Nottawasopi here in Band of the Potawatomi and our local communities here. So it's not that broader, um, just generic type trauma, which isn't bad, but just to make it more specific to us. And during that time also, I was fortunate enough to be accepted as uh, one of the people to be a master trainer of ACEs through the Michigan ACEs initiative here to try to expand that awareness and education um, about ACEs and the near science and, you know, neuroscience, epigenetics, resilience. ACEs and resilience building and community healing overall. So that's, in a quick nutshell, <laughs> the effort that done. I love it. Um, I especially love that you customize the programs to meet your specific tribe and also looking at integrating multiple funding streams and partners to um, help support this work. I heard you speak on reflective practices, and I was like, oh, I love this, because anyone who knows the responsive caregiving work that we've done has heard us speak to responsive and reflective practices. So all of these things are so tied together in this work. So my last question for you, and then we're going to move on to questions. If there are any additional questions, I see that a lot of them have been um, moving through the chat room, which I think is fabulous. Um, but do you have a specific effort or outcome related to what you've done that you are most proud of accomplishing? I think it's the, the fact that we've been able to um, bring more people on board who 
support this and understand that this is important and are willing to continue this effort for all of our staff to be trained, to uh, continue to reach out to our community members, because many of them, even though they're tribal members, don't understand how that historical trauma continues to play a role in behaviors today that are traumatizing and continue to continue that cycle. Um, we don't, we haven't, we aren't yet to the point, but we're looking at the, being able to measure some specific outcomes, but we're not there yet, but that hopefully will come someday. So it's just the fact that we're continuing to have that conversation, continuing to explore and expand, and it's not stagnant, it's dynamic and changing. I love it. And as Audrey was talking about, it's, it's really important that everybody get in the sandbox and play together. And um, just tying all of that together is so important. So thank you so much, Meg, for your time, too. Thank you very much to all of our speakers today. Um, many of the questions were answered within the chat box, but given time, we are going to go ahead and move on to the um, evaluation polls that we need to do at the end of each of our webinars. If your question wasn't answered today, please remember that we will be having a follow-up session next week. And we also have the opportunity, um, some of them you may be able to get responses from our presenters for you for next week. So we just want you to know that we'll, we won't try to, we'll try to make sure that all of your questions get answered. So please make sure you take a moment to fill in our polls. These help us do our work even better. Um, we might like to know from you how much is your understanding increased and how we how likely are you use, to use any of these strategies or practices? And are there any other webinar topics that would be useful to you? More strategies to support providers to move away from expulsion and suspension. Yes, I agree, I agree. <laughs> And someone else does too. Wonderful. More information about extending trauma-informed information to families. Yes. Child development and behavior. Strategies for providers dealing with vicarious trauma. Yes. Taking care of the caregiver is so important. And including and specifically around trauma. Great. I'm so glad that you're adding to the topics um, chat pod because that really does help us to think about what more we can do and where we can expand our work as well. So that's really helpful. All right. And then moving back to um, our presentation, I want to just follow up with you about what's going to happen next. Um, here we go. So a wrap up. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone who was part of the conversation today. Thank you to our state and tribal presenters. Um, our next step, so we have a follow-up discussion opportunity that will happen on January 15th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. I'm so sad that I cannot be on that, but I will be in a training myself. So I will hope that most of you can come back and be re-engaged in a conversation where you can ask even a deeper dive of some of the questions that you had in the chat box. Um, really appreciate everyone participating today. And um, want to share with you, if you're not familiar with the Infant Toddler Resource Guide, please make sure that you check that out. I think it's very helpful to those of you who work with infants and toddlers and um, has a lot of great resources in it. And then Katari, did you want to talk a moment about the ACEs and school age briefs? Yes, um, these were uh, two of our most recent resources for school age, um, the school age population, out of school time population. In March of 2019, we published a research brief, Adverse Childhood Experiences in the School Age Population, Implications for Child Care Policy and Out of School Time Programs. Um, 
And in this brief, uh, Tennessee is highlighted. And as a, a follow-up in the summer, um, NK's published a practice brief responding to adverse childhood experiences, strategies for out of school time for the out of school time field. And these are both two resources we believe that can be helpful to states, territories, and tribes, as well as municipalities and programs that are considering strategies to prevent and mitigate ACEs and the effects of trauma and build resilience in their school age population. Thanks, Jean. Absolutely. And thank you all for participating today. You are so engaged and so um, I just in awe of the answers that you provided in the chat boxes. So thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity to lead this webinar today.